Welcome to the Stuttering Mind interview series. Today it's my great pleasure to be talking with Dr. Christian Kell. He is a neuroscientist from the Brain Imaging Center, Frankfurt, Germany, who published a research paper in 2009 entitled How the Brain Repairs Stuttering. Without further ado, let's welcome Dr. Christian to the call. Hello, Dr. Chris. Thank you for joining me. Hey, Rama. You're welcome. Glad to talk to you. Cool. So could you summarize your research paper on how the brain repairs stuttering? Yeah, so we um, scanned using functional magnetic resonance imaging in, well, earlier than 2000, 2009. So we started actually, I think in 2005 or so, we um, started scanning um, adult people who stutter. Um, I think we included 13 male participants who um, stuttered from their early childhood and um, we studied their brain activity during reading aloud, so German sentences reading aloud, um, before and after fluency shaping therapy. So the idea was to look at the functional correlates uh, of what this therapy actually changes in the brain and we compared this activity to the brain activity of fluent people who stutter and uh, also to 13 male participants who used to stutter for years but um, have um, um, stopped stuttering uh, without any, well, let's say, um, causal um, therapy, so spontaneous recovery. And uh, what we observed was that um, if, you com if we compared people who stutter um, or the, their brain activity during, during speaking with uh, the brain activity of uh, fluent speakers, we observed something that is often seen in, in many imaging stutter, uh, studies on stuttering, that you actually see an overactivation of the right hemisphere. So usually the left half of the brain is the part of the brain that is um, well, able to produce speech fluently. And we were basically confirmed this over-recruitment of the right hemisphere, of the right half of the brain, in those um, uh, participants. What is noteworthy, I think, is that um, those were moderate to severe, uh, severely stuttering speakers. But in the scanner, in the social, uh, social isolation, in the bore, and um, yeah, in the, in maybe also due to auditory masking, because you have this constant scanner noise around, um, the, all the participants were fluent. So even if you have a severe stutter, inside the scanner, usually participants do not stutter. And this is maybe surprising, but this is actually something that we wish to, uh, that's, a, that's, a, that's a good condition for us as researchers because we can compare the brain activity during quasi similar overt behavior, right? We know that it's not completely identical, but still I think it's comparable behavior and thus any change in brain activity is rather related to the pathophysiology or the compensation um, for stuttering. And so the, uh, I think the advantage is that we're not, not looking at different states and examine, well, how does the brain look during a stutter, but rather how does it look without an overt stuttering behavior in mm. comparison to someone who is not at all stuttering usually. Mm. Fantastic. And uh, what were your conclusions? Does the brain actually repair stuttering? So, um, Yes, indeed. So, as you know, um, there are several um, uh, therapies around. Uh, we decided to investigate um, a fluency shaping um, therapy where the speech uh, tempo is rather reduced during therapy, uh, where the speech prosody is drastically altered. So, um, I think one of the targets of the therapy is really a change in the way of speaking. And um, on the behavioral level, this therapy is quite successful. Um, and I think we, it, it was a two weeks intensive course that was followed by regular 
um, refresher courses, even online courses or um, computer-assisted uh, um, uh, training, refresher training. Mm -hmm. And so on the behavioral level, this therapy, uh, um, in Germany it's called the Kassel-Stotter-Therapy, this fluency shaping therapy is quite successful mm -hmm. in most of the um, participants to really um, reduce the stuttering frequency, so the percent of stuttered syllables to below 2%, two, uh, two which is really, um, really excellent. And so what we observed is that this, uh, that this right hemispheric overactivation that we see in people who had not yet had um, such a therapy, so quasi-therapy uh, naive participants, mm -hmm. that this overactivation was drastically reduced um, due to this therapy program and lateralized back to the left hemisphere, which is the physiological half of the brain that usually produces speech. Mm. And so uh, I think this we reported in 2009 in this, in this brain paper, mm. but I recently reanalyzed the data and looked at the functional connectivity, so the interaction between uh, brain regions. Mm -hmm. And uh, what we observed was that this relateralization of activity to the left hemisphere was associated with a change in functional connectivity between the regions that process the auditory feedback of what just has been produced and the motor control, let's say, the, the motor regions um, in the brain. So what we observed was mm. that people who stutter have a reduced um, interaction between the feedback processing regions and the motor regions that actually are um, relevant in producing speech. And this fits nicely, I think, with um, lots of other studies who have shown that people who stutter, uh, who stutter may have deficits in auditory motor interactions. So not even only verbal, but maybe also nonverbal auditory motor interactions that could be disturbed in people who stutter. So there's one influential idea. Mm that auditory feedback is important um, in stuttering and this was an, a nice or interesting observation to see that indeed um, people who stutter have a reduced functional connectivity between the auditory and the motor cortex. And what we observed now linked to this therapy program was that the, the connectivity between auditory regions and motor re regions um, was improved after therapy but notably not in those, um, not between those regions that were functionally altered in the people who stutter before therapy, but rather in neighboring regions. So, and uh, these were particularly regions that usually are associated with feedback processing of slower auditory features. So it seems that people who stutter may have a um, reduced auditory motor mapping between regions that are important in processing fast um, changes in the auditory signal. Hmm. And um, our data suggested that this therapy program that actually slows down speech hmm. um, is able to recruit a connection between regions that are more involved in, in um, yeah, in controlling those slower speech features. and. Um, Please note that during the scanning itself, the participants spoke quasi equally um, uh, if, you, if you look at the controls and even the people who stutter. So there was no real behavioral over difference. So mm. that's interesting. So training obviously with reduced speech tempo may help the brain to repair itself. Mm. This is very interesting. And um, neuroplasticity. Yes. I assume this is what you are referring to, how the brain actually regenerates neural connections. Am I correct? Yes, absolutely. absolutely. Okay. So, um, obviously we cannot say much about the mechanisms behind this observation, hmm. um, but neuroplasticity obviously is not something that comes out of the blue. Neuro neuroplasticity is something that you can actually train, right? Hmm. So um, I think this intensive course helps participants to actually tap into a plasticity mechanism that seems to be available to most of the people who stutter. I'm, I'm not, I don't want to push it too far and say everybody, right? But mm -hmm. um, in, if you look at the average um, response, you actually see this relateralization to the left half of the brain 
of brain activity during speech production mm. associated with the recruitment of those regions who actually map slower speech features even if you don't speak slowly anymore mm -hmm. right so it seems that the, that training with reduced speech tempo may, may help people who stutter to to actually recruit those plasticity mechanisms excellent excellent that's really good news um there are severe over stutterers who manifest their stuttering with physical movements in an attempt to get the word out. There are covert stutterers who are adept at changing words in order to appear fluent. And there are mild stutterers who don't exhibit such symptoms. How does the brain scan differ? No, not at all. We don't know yet. We don't know yet because it's very difficult to, to conduct group studies, right? Having mm people really all have similar behavior and compare them with people who don't. Mm. Uh, I think we're, we're just starting to understand the basics, right? And mm. um, it's very difficult to, to examine inter-individual differences, but in order to do this, you would need to have much larger group sizes mm. to make sure that you can actually claim that a certain behavior is associated with a certain brain activity. Mm. So at the moment, we're not at all there for example, also predicting whether a certain therapy will have an effect or not, right? So mm. sometimes there are conditions where you have slight hints whether a therapy program will be effective or not based on neural data, mm. but in stuttering we're not there yet. Okay, cool. And for example, when I was younger, I could read out aloud and uh, talk to my cat without stuttering. I could speak mm -hmm. perfectly fine. But when I was speaking with my parents or with uh, friends, I would start to stumble and it would um, it would grow to the monster that it became. Um, I assume there hasn't been any studies uh, looking at the brain scans as to how come people can speak perfectly well when they are in their own bubble, when they're on their own and when they're in front of other people, they stutter. Yeah, I'm, I'm not aware of, of publications on brain scans during speech production so i'm i know that there are that there are brain scans of people who stutter listening to other people who stutter speak okay and um and do you know do you know what the conclusions were or could you refer me to yeah them? it's pretty so so there again i'm um it is an interesting finding but it simply tells you hmm. that there are differences for example in the in the speech processing regions if you listen to people who stutter compared to fluent speech for example okay um, and so so this is well this is obvious right because you have a different auditory input hmm. um but for sure, I'm actually I'm, I don't remember pretty um, pretty well whether uh, they also had the contrast um, of um, people who stutter listening to uh, stuttered speech compared to fluent speakers uh, listening mm. to stuttered speech. I think they had it and they showed differences. But um, even if they if even if there are differences, I, I would not overinterpret that. Right. So it simply tells you that. Uh, someone who stutters perceives stuttered speech differently compared to someone who's not stuttering. And I think this is not really surprising because if mm. you have um, an autobiographic memory for stuttering events, you will have a different reaction to stuttered speech compared to someone who has, for example, never heard someone stutter. Mm. And you saw that or that was shown in the imaging scans? Yes, yes, yes. I think you can find that on the internet. I'm, I'm afraid I can't, I can't provide you with okay. a reference right now. No worries. Uh, but you, 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 can, you can look that up. That's very interesting. So, so the people who stuttered were more fluent or they stuttered less with other people who stuttered. And that was shown in the brain imaging where they were... No, no, no. This was, this was a study on speech perception. So really listening to speech. It was not on, on speech production. So I'm not okay. aware, but maybe they are. You, you would need to check. Mm. I'm not aware of newer studies, for example, lo looking at speech production mm. in, convers in conversation with other people who stutter or with people who are fluent. I, I'm not aware of these studies. Mm, yes. Uh, quite early on in my journey to freedom, I, yeah. uh, I learned that when I was with other people who stuttered, I was fluent or I was okay I was myself I didn't stutter because mm -hmm. in my own mind I was comfortable I wasn't being judged by them and I was free to be myself express myself 
so I had no no real tension but in the same in the same minute if I was with a fluent speaker my speech would fall apart yes so it's yes. very interesting so I think there's uh, for sure there there is um, an important psychological component to stuttering hmm. um, I was I did my postdoctoral work in Paris and you may know that in France the psychoanalysts are actually pretty um, pretty important and they have a huge uh, psychoanalytical culture there mm -hmm. and we had a, a, a very interesting debate um, on the question are those psychological symptoms secondary to a neurobiological um, a problem or and that was their view is everything we see in brain scans for example is that simply a consequence of a psychological trauma before right and so obviously it's very difficult to uh, to disentangle that um, I think we have pretty good evidence now also from genetics that there is a genetic component um, to stuttering we have um, well we have pretty good evidence I think that there may be a, a primary new neurobiological um, problem that leads to stuttering hmm. um, I can and but the interesting argument is um, uh, so if you speak for example to a psychoanalyst how do how can you be sure that whatever you observe uh, even in stuttering kids is not already a consequence of a psychotrauma so uh, we cannot entirely be sure that a psychological trauma can also um, contribute for example to stuttering and I would not at all rule that out Mm. But um, I, on the other hand, I would argue against this notion that um, stuttering is a psychological or psych uh, some purely psychiatric um, um, disorder. I would, I would definitely disagree on that, and I think there's pretty good evidence for a neurobiological um, um, reason for stuttering. And so um, what you described there um, is typical, right? You're not at all alone with uh, the notion that if you are, for example, in more demanding situations, in emotional situations, mm -hmm. that your stutter would become more intense. Mm -hmm. And um, a, a very straightforward um, interpretation would be that your brain if um, already always tries to compensate if you have this deficit, right? Mm -hmm. So imagine you have an, a neurobiological deficit, so let's simplify now and say you have a deficit in auditory motor mapping, mm -hmm. and uh, so the brain tries to compensate for that. And so we know that the right brain tries to assist and tries mm -hmm. to help out to reduce stuttering, but the problem is it does not seem to to um, to lead to a full recovery, right? Because otherwise people would not continue stuttering hmm. and so the regions that we see there um, that are activated in people who stutter that not yet had a therapy uh, those regions belong to a so-called control network and this control network in the brain is important for everything you're doing right so you need this control network if you are I don't know if you plan your holidays or you think what you still have to work and hmm. um, so for these things you need this network and if you use this network in part also to compensate for stuttering it seems clear that your resources may be limited and in case you are engaged in more difficult tasks for example then your stuttering would be uh, would uh, become more severe because your compensation mechanisms um, are used for something else hmm. and there's for sure also a huge um, uh, emotional component right hmm. so if you um, uh, if you become emotional about your speech uh, then uh, this may not be helpful at all because you attribute uh, fear and negative values to something that is usually automatized. Mm -hmm. That's true actually because when I used to get angry, I could speak, not stuttering. It's mm -hmm. like an emotional part took over. Yes. That's true. Um, is there any indication that stuttering could be a learned behavior? Example, a habituated way of speaking with sound and word repetitions and built up over a period of years, the adult stutterer continues that way of speaking subconsciously. Mm -hmm. I would not believe, but that's just uh, my, my interpretation, I would not believe that this is at the core of stuttering. Um, I'm pretty sure that the stuttering events by themselves 
um, illicit learning. I absolutely agree. So if you if you um, uh, if you experience more and more stuttering events, this will have a negative connotation, for example, hmm. and you may learn this association between speaking and negative emotions. And hmm. this, in turn, may have consequences for your speaking, uh, for your way of speaking. So, hmm. yes, there will be a learning component, hmm. but, but I don't believe that stuttering by itself is just something that someone has learned, right? Hmm. Yes, I think I would have to agree. It would be the feedback reactions that I got from the adults around me that made me think stuttering was bad and something to be avoided, which built up over a number of years. Yes. Cool. And how is it, in your opinion, it is possible for some adults to stop, stop, to stop stuttering? For example, US Vice President Joe Biden, he's reported to have started into his 30s and after a while, he stopped stuttering. How is it possible? Yes. So this brings me now to the uh, people who recovered spontaneously in adulthood, mm -hmm. right? You know, uh, you may know that most of the kids who actually um, have disfluencies uh, during their speech development, mm. um, and not just physiological ones, but uh, actually are, st are stuttering, um, they recover um, early on also during their childhood, right? Um, but there are a couple of people who start into adulthood who usually not really suddenly but um, who lose their stutter mm. um, over a couple of months or years and um, I think Katrin Neumann from Bochum she uh, will be publishing soon a paper on um, interviews with those people and uh, the aim was to find um, conclusive uh, strategies, for example, um, in their reports um, and to see whether there is a common feature that actually may help also other people to get rid of their stuttering. And um, the, uh, I cannot say too much because it's not yet published, but mm. I, if I remember well, there was not a single strategy. So there was a very high individual variability and what they tried to tease apart are different clusters mm. of of strategies and so it will be really really interesting reading that paper um, but let's say uh, in the meanwhile there we don't have we don't have consistent reports on recovery um, so this is why brain imaging may be really helpful to look at the brain activity of those people who recovered spontaneously and what we saw is that those people actually have normalized auditory motor mapping mm -hmm. um, so they seemed to have pretty well compensated for the deficit and to have repaired that deficit. And what we observed is um, a role of the cerebellum, which is the part of the brain that is primarily involved in controlling coordination. Mm -hmm. And um, what we observed was that in people who are recovered from stuttering and uh, during adulthood, that um, they actually disconnect part of the superior cerebellum from the speech production network and interestingly through a region that is evolved also in the effective evaluation of behavior so we found this orbitofrontal cortex uh, being important in recovery hmm. and um, so it seems that this orbitofrontal cortex um, is differently involved in speech uh, in speech production in people who recovered from stuttering compared to people who stutter, and this was actually the only region that significantly um, dissociated people who still stutter from people who recover from their stuttering. And the role that we um, believe this um, change plays is a a different emotional evaluation of the act of speaking. Um, and interestingly, it's, it may have to do, we're not yet sure uh, about this, it may have to do with the, the uh, um, evaluation of the auditory compared to the somatosensory feedback. Mm -hmm. So it seems um, that un, uh, until you, you um, did not fix the auditory ma motor mapping, you rely more on the somatosensory feedback, so the feeling uh, of your mouth for producing speech hmm. and after therapy and after such a, such a spontaneous recovery for example it seems that the auditory feedback um, or the importance of the auditory feedback is restored that's very interesting cool 
Uh, is there any truth that stuttering runs in families? There are, yes, absolutely. There are twin studies where you um, compare, um, uh, how do you call that in English, mono, uh, the twins, the different forms of twins. So, um, no, how do you call that? There are two types of twins. Yes, I know what you mean, but the word slips my mind as well. Um, um, so, two types of you twins. You have uh, identical twins? Yes, that's the point. So, identical twins. Okay. And um, so they have the same genetic background. Yes. And um, but they are raised in the same family, right? Yes. And you can also compare them to non-identical twins who are also part of the same family, right? Yes. And so if you do that, you see that there is a stronger um, relationship with stuttering in identical twins compared to non-identical twins. And this clearly shows you that there's a genetic component to it. Mm, very interesting. And uh, do you have any further plans to study as to how the brain can repair stuttering by examining people who used to stutter and no longer affected by the stutter? Yeah, it, it will be absolutely important. I think what my colleagues in other research labs did the last years was a great, great work. So mm -hmm. they went the other way around. They looked first what happens in stuttering kids, mm. because um, our studies were conducted in adults. And there you cannot never be sure whether what you see is a consequence of year long stuttering or whether it really has to do with, for example, pathophysiological changes. So mm -hmm. the, uh, the cause of stuttering. And so I think what, what my colleagues have shown first now in the kids is um, that this, this anomaly in the left half of the brain is mm -hmm. really at the core of the pathophysiology of stuttering. Mm -hmm. And this right hemispheric overactivation may more directly be related with compensation attempts. So mm -hmm. this, this was really important work. And I think the next 10 years we'll spend it's uh, looking, uh, for example, at recovery mechanisms, but it's difficult to recruit those uh, people. Mm. Um, I don't have any current project going on, but I hope that someone, uh, if, I'm, if it's not me doing that, uh, if uh, one of my colleagues will start um, uh, working on, on that topic again, then it will be important to disseminate this information and try to recruit people for also maybe uh, via the web to make sure that we get enough um, participants um, to conduct proper proper studies on recovery and stuttering. Mm. Why do you think um, some children, or in fact a lot of children, who stutter when they're three, four, they spontaneously recover and they don't have any issues? And then the tiny minority, they hold on to this stuttering and it develops. Why yes, do you think? That's a, that's a very important question. Uh, we don't have the answer yet. Mm. Um, it may be that they have a different genetic background. It may be that they have different neuroplasticity uh, mechanisms available. It mm. may be that they have a different way of coping with it. And so, for example, have mm. a different learning um, um, compared to, to the other kids who recover. So it's really, um, uh, we. I, I'm, I know that my colleagues are working on that because obviously this is a very important question. Hmm. Um, but I, I, at least to my knowledge, I'm not aware of, um, of individual factors that have been identified that will make the distinction. Uh, I'm pretty sure that there, there's really old work already on the, um, the, the, the analysis of um, the speech signal itself. Hmm. And I think even there you cannot dissociate clearly which kid is going to recover and uh, which other kid is going to continue stuttering. Mm. So um, if, if you ask me, I'm pretty sure it will be a mixture of all those effects. So maybe some other genetic background, maybe mm. some other neuroplastic mechanisms, and maybe also another way to, to cope and deal with uh, stuttering symptoms. Mm, mm, mm. For me, um, what I've learned is that um, the brain or the subconscious mind controls 95% of the processes. For example, breathing, uh, walking, doing everything. The brain is responsible for 95% of the human body, including speaking. So speaking is a subconscious process. So 
Would you say that or would you disagree? Um, maybe I would try to refine that. So I'm okay. pretty sure that much of my speaking is automatized. I agree, right? So mm -hmm. without any effort, I'm speaking. But mm. um, to call it subconscious, uh, I wouldn't agree on, on that. So most parts of my control of articulation may be subconscious. Okay. But the way of speaking itself is a clearly conscious process. Mm -hmm. So, for example, when you're having a debate with your colleagues, when you're doing a PhD, yes. uh, you just spoke spontaneously. Your brain um, automatically filled uh, with the relevant uh, questions and answers for you for you to be able to debate. You didn't have to consciously tell your mouth to open and to speak, and you didn't have to breathe and speak. It was all subconscious, right, doctor? Uh, I absolutely agree. So it's mm. not. A, yeah, yeah. So so the. The muscle reflexes and the exact articulation, most of that is not conscious. I, I absolutely agree. But the, the act of speaking mm. is clearly conscious, right? So you're aware of what you, what you produce. Sometimes, sometimes when I'm in a heated argument with my wife, yeah. sometimes that the world just come out. So I don't know if I'm conscious. <laughs> don't, blame, don't blame your... your, your. <laughs> Don't blame your unconscious part. I think, um, no, I'm, I'm pretty sure that um, very, very, very rarely you produce unconscious utterances. So this my apps is the absolute exception. So mm. usually I, I, would, I would rather um, disagree and say, you know, the, the standard, the, the, the standard, um, way of speaking is, is a conscious one, including all the automatized processes that are below. And most of them are unconscious, I have to agree. But I would, so for example, I would not at all, breathing is very different, right? So breathing is really an automatized uh, motor behavior hmm. um, that obviously continues during sleep, right? And mm -hmm. um, I would argue that you would not usually speak during sleeping but I, I agree there are exceptions right mm -hmm. um but most of the speaking processes i would i would rather say they are conscious mm. so if breathing is a subconscious process and to speak you need to be able to breathe mm -hmm. and if your breathing is affected because when i used to stutter quite badly mm -hmm. i would have like a panic attack and i would mm -hmm. freeze and the subconscious processes would be conscious where I would basically struggle, I would block, you know? Yes. Yeah. And what changed was I went on an intensive program which taught mm -hmm. me to breathe again and to speak mm -hmm. consciously, be really conscious about how I'm getting the words out and taking my time and speaking. And you're quite mm -hmm. right, by slowing down the speech, it really helped me to gain the first step in my journey to freedom. However, that wasn't the end story. It took me 16 years of self-development, reading books, of realizing that I am more than just the body. I am the spirit. There's a spirit within me, within each and every one of us, Dr. Chris, that is connected to the universe. When I realized that, the fear went away. So it was a conscious effort on my part to retrain my subconscious saying that the things which I had learned previously as a child and as an adult meant that I was afraid of the world. I was afraid of doing anything. I was, I was holding back in life. I wasn't enjoying life. I just didn't do anything because my brain, my subconscious, subconscious mind made it an automatic process for me to not even partake in life. For example, when I was in a conversation with two or three people, I would hold back. I wouldn't speak much. I would just be the wallflower. And that continued for a long time, you know? And that's the reason which I was asking about the subconscious part. It may not affect my speaking ability, but it did affect who I was as a person. I would, I would not be sure that it didn't affect your speech ability. So I'm, I'm pretty sure that those emotional aspects, they mm. have an impact on speaking. 
Because if you start getting afraid of the act of speaking itself, mm. you will run into difficulties. And I absolutely agree. So this this overemphasis and maybe the, the wish to perfectly be fluent, right? This this may not always be an, for for every for everybody a good recipe, right? Because um, usually I am fluent, so I'm not really focusing on the way I'm speaking. Hmm. And um, this attention on the act of speaking may have consequences. I agree, and so I'm pretty sure that what what you just described, hmm. um, dealing with anxiety, dealing with um, shame, social isolation, all that, hmm. um, is important. And so I'm I'm not pushing forward the idea um, that every um, every everyone who stutters should only speak slow more slowly right so this is this would not lead to to a better life i would say mm. um but it, it can be one one part of the game and so um obviously dealing with secondary symptoms dealing with um, uh, emotions and uh, also the, the the attitude towards speaking is absolutely critical and this also includes breathing by the way right so uh, mm. although breathing is um, it's clearly also physical and, and corporal, but it's um, uh, you also have, have uh, obviously an, an influence of the emotions on breathing, and you know that there are a couple of therapies who primarily focus on breathing in, in stuttering therapy. Mm. Uh, what part would you say, or oh, sorry, what percentage would you say is genetics, is neuro neurological, or you have no idea? No idea. This would be a pure guess, and that's not really professional. So, <laughs> sorry about that. No worries, because I am. I'm looking back at my life, Doctor Chris. Okay, I'm now 42. When I was 21, I was really in a bad place. I was really, I was really in a bad place. And 21 years on, I'm free. I'm free. I'm speaking to you because I'm free, and I love connecting with people. I love talking with people. I love to know what they think, what they have learned about stuttering and in general their lives. Mm -hmm. So for me, yes, I can believe, quite, I can quite rightly believe that genetics and neurological has a part, but I believe it is a huge percentage psychological, how I perceive myself as a person who started looking on in the world where stuttering was deemed as bad and something to be avoided and where fluency was the holy grail, you know? Mm -hmm. And that grew and grew and I had no way out. Mm -hmm. So I'm Obviously really... You found one. Sorry? Obviously you found a way out. Yes, yes. And what I'm hoping with my book series mm -hmm. is that I want to interview people to gain more of an understanding as to how I made the journey and how other people can model. Because mm. I believe people can model people who have stopped this habit. It may, be, it may be something which people aren't happy hearing mm. that stuttering is a habit, but I believe stuttering was a habit that I picked up, that I continued with the fear, emotions and all the negative feedback that I got which resulted in the way that I behaved, which meant that I started more, which meant that I held back in life, which meant I didn't do anything, you know? Sure. So I think well, there, there's one important aspect. Um, I'm pretty sure that you are also in contact with lots of people who stutter. Hmm. And there are, there are um, as you know, everybody uh, is different. And um, yes. so there are, there are numerous people who stutter who are fine with their stuttering, right? And mm. who live a, a, a great life um, despite their stuttering. And they, they don't really follow this, this path towards fluency and say, okay, why should I be fluent? I'm a stutterer mm. and I live with that. I think this is also a, a nice way to cope with it, right? So I, I'm, I'm pretty sure that you, neither you nor, nor us or someone else should say, okay, this is the way out of stuttering or this is the way how someone who stutters should um, 
um, should try to recover for you for example sometimes people don't want to recover and still have a great life and there will be many different ways out of out of stuttering in case they wish to um, to do something against their stuttering and so one aspect in is psychological and you have obviously a very nice study where you say okay uh, or you have a very nice story where you say um, my my experience was that there, there is a huge psychological um, influence on my stuttering and so this experience may help a lot of people who stutter right but the stories may be very different in other people who stutter mm. so i think this is the problem right you cannot easily generalize i think you're spot on uh, in saying that um, some people are happy with the stuttering it doesn't mm -hmm. bother them at all and they live their lives perfectly well without without any um, regrets Regrets has been a big part of my life and other people who started that I know personally have a lot of regrets. Sure. So I hope that the work that the neuroscientists are doing now and will do in the future will enable more research into the ways people can recover or they can be free from the stuttering mind, you know? Mm -hmm. I, I pretty much agree and I think everything, all that research can provide are options, right? Are different options so that people can, can try them out and see whether it helps them. Um, as always, um, therapy usually has side effects and you need to tell people about it. Mm -hmm. So in case of behavioral mm -hmm. therapy, it's simply the time that you spend and maybe also um, mm -hmm. the, in, in the case of fluency shaping, for example, a change in the naturalness of the speech. Yes. Um, but this is something, well, you, you pay a price, obviously, right? If, you, if I give you a certain drug, um, there are side effects and usually it also behavioral therapy will, um, will come with a price. So um, I think, yeah, what we can do is we can try to investigate um, also the individual inter-individual variability so in the long term hopefully as in for example cancer therapy we will have more individualized therapy options than we have right now great uh, one last question dr. Chris how did you get involved in in the research of stuttering so um, I had a colleague here in Frankfurt uh, that was dr. Ali Giraud she used to work in Frankfurt and she was interested in stuttering um, and uh, she asked me whether I would like to get involved uh, into the, in that research and I actually um, did that first because um, I uh, wanted to do a human, human neuroscience. I did uh, actually basic neuroscience during my thesis before, so um, I did work uh, on uh, using animal models and I uh, although this is very important, I actually wanted to continue doing my research with people who I can actually ask whether they want to participate in my research or not. So this is why I wanted to go to human neuroscience and I'm a neurologist, so that's mm. not very far from my everyday work. And she proposed that topic and I found it interesting and um, I must say I had really the chance to get into, into that field because it is neurobiologically a very interesting um, um, topic hmm. and I uh, yeah, enjoy very much uh, interacting also with people who stutter. Uh, I must say sometimes I, I have this sim sympathetic stutter which is really weird because I never stuttered as a kid hmm. but sometimes I get into a conversation with people who stutter I have this slight sympathetic um, uh, automatized uh, disfluencies that come up. That's something very interesting. I actually love to go into that and see why this is the case. Um, but I enjoy working with, uh, with people who start. I think it's, uh, it's a nice community. You, you actually have a nice community and um, yeah, so that was the reason. Nice colleague, nice and interesting topic and doing human yours as a part of animal work. Cool, that's great. Thank you so much uh, for your time, Dr. Chris. You're welcome, and thanks a lot. It was a pleasure talking with you.